Liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, liebe Freunde des Ambos Studientelegramms, Markus at home welcomes Dr. Eugene Bornwald in Boston, with whom we would like to discuss heart failure. Dr. Bornwald, it's a unique privilege for us to host you tonight. If I may introduce um, Dr. Bronwell very quickly, it, probably all of our viewers know him. He has been uh, well, mentioned and claimed the most uh, influential cardiologist of the last years by the uh, Nobel Prize winners still living out there. So, and Dr. Bronwell has been leading uh, both the Brigham and Women's Department of Cardiology for many years, as well as the NIH and has indeed over decades contributed to modern cardiology as we live it today and particularly contributed to research. And he still um, leads the um, Timmy study group, which has been founded by himself, providing us tremendous research and insights into what we are doing in everyday uh, clinical cardiology today. So we are very, very happy, uh, Dr. Brownwell, to have you today. And um, uh, keen on your on your lecture and also the opportunity to ask you some questions. So thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you for the invitation, and it's nice uh, to be with you. Um, what I would like to do um, is to give you an overview of heart failure. I have been involved uh, with heart failure for uh, more than 70 years, uh, and um, it's been a very exciting field, and I want to give you what you might call a 50,000 foot view of it, uh, which will take me a few minutes. And then we have the opportunity for going back and forth. So um, the um, uh, treatment of heart failure that I'm going to describe is over 70 years. And uh, uh, 72 years, as a matter of fact, in 1950, I was a medical student at New York University. And um, uh, also Bellevue Hospital, the largest city hospital in New York at the time with uh, about 4,000 beds. We had very little available for the treatment of uh, uh, heart failure. Low salt diet, which was very difficult for people. Digitalis, which we don't know whether, how effective it is any longer. And uh, diuretics were injections of, uh, of mercury which were very painful. It was a weak uh, uh, diuretic. And um, uh, so the treatment of heart failure was really very primitive. Uh, in 1960, a major change occurred. And I'm going to describe these changes. And there are a few of them have a red circle or a red ellipse around them. And that was the development of thiazides which is one of the great advances in the treatment of heart failure, because this were the first orally active diuretics. And it meant that people could be given a prescription. They didn't have to come back for injections and uh, uh, it uh, controlled their edema. Um, a few years later in 1967, uh, a, the loop diuretics, furosemide and drugs like that appeared much more powerful than the thiazides and that uh, further uh, improved heart failure. Now, at that time, during the 1960s, I was working at the National Heart Institute, the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. And one of the observations that we made at that time was that there was a uh, neurohormonal stimulation that went on in heart failure. And we studied this both in experimental animals and in patients, particularly activation of the sympath sympathetic nervous system. Uh, so as a result of that, a result of the finding of this, uh, uh, other investigators uh, came up uh, with vasodilators. And vasodilators at that time were uh, nonspecific, like uh, uh, nitroglycerin, nitroprusside, uh, to combat the uh, vasoconstriction, uh, which is part of a severe heart failure. You can also see in 1969 was the first cardiac transplantation 
it was occurred that occurred in uh, uh, Cape Town, South Africa. And um, uh, of course, this uh, began the whole field of, of uh, 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 human transplantation. In the early 1980s, another major advance occurred uh, going from uh, vasodilators to ACE inhibitors. ACE inhibitors, of course, uh, uh, go to the fundamental problem of uh, increased activation of the renin angiotensin system. And, uh, uh, and uh, they were shown um, for the first time to really prolong life in patients with heart failure. And the other um, neurohormonal blocker that became available and was studied clinically were beta blockers. So you see uh, between 1980 and 1990, a tremendous explosion of, um, um, of treatments uh, for heart failure, uh, all based on this inhibition of neurohormonal stimulation. Um, and uh, with, with both of them prolonging lives substantially in clinical trials. And that's why I have the red ellipse about both ACE inhibitors and beta blockers. And uh, then um, in 1995, uh, for people who couldn't tolerate ACE inhibitors, the angiotensin receptor blockers came along. Now, 2000, the turn of the millennium, very interesting. Two uh, additional treatments became available. The uh, first trial to show prolongation of life with an implanted left ventricular assist device. Um, this led to both the European and uh, the American um, uh, regulators uh, approving uh, uh, these devices. And MRA is mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. So this is yet another um, uh, neurohormonal uh, 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 stimulant which is released. Uh, early in um, uh, this century, implanted cardiovascular by uh, implanted cardioverted defibrillators, the ICDs, and uh, cardiac resynchronization therapy, CRT, um, became uh, popular and improved uh, treatment. Um, now, coming down to the last few years, the angiotensin receptor nebulized inhibitor, the ARNI, um, which puts together uh, two neurohormonal uh, blockers um, becoming more powerful than ACE inhibitors, really uh, an extension of the ACE inhibition um, was released and, and that has made uh, a significant uh, advance. And uh, uh, more recently, the SGLT2 inhibitors, um, to everyone's surprise, these uh, drugs which uh, uh, as you know, increase the, uh, um, the excretion of uh, uh, glucose and sodium that came into use as anti-diabetics, and they have a very profound effect on cardiac function. And uh, um, in patients with uh, a wide variety of ejection fractions, the SGLT2 inhibitors have been shown to prolong life. And uh, the last point I want to make is, is to look ahead to the year 2025, uh, perhaps three years from now, maybe it'll take longer, because as you all know, there has been uh, the first patient has undergone xenotransplantation with a pig heart, a mo genetically modified pig uh, heart, was taken and uh, transplanted into a patient with terminal heart failure. Uh, the patient survived the operation, uh, but uh, uh, developed um, 
uh, a viral infection about two months later and passed away. But it does show that it is possible to implant if it's genetically um, uh, modified, it's possible to uh, 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 transplant a big pick heart into a human and get it to beat. So that's still a question mark about where we're going. So this is a brief summary. It begins in 1950 when I was a medical student and ends, uh, we don't know when, but uh, let's say 2025. And I would be pleased to uh, engage in any discussion. We can leave the slide on while we have the conversation. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Braunwald, for this really unprecedented uh, view uh, over 70 years of heart failure therapy and, and what may be yet to come. And, and we're so happy that actually somebody with, who has really seen and, and, and experienced all these developments to judge what is maybe most important and what might come in the future. It might be a stupid question, but what, what you put some ellipses, as, as you said, on the most important developments that you mentioned, neuro hormone uh, blockade. Uh, interestingly, today in the clinical practice, we find ARNI therapy very important also. Um, obviously, the cardiac transplantation um, changed the views and possibility at the end stage heart failure. What in your opinion is, opinion is the most important development, maybe not the most important drug, single drug, but the development per se, or the most important diagnostic technique? Uh, from a diagnostic uh, point of view, I think that um, the uh, measurement of uh, anti-proBNP um, you know, seals the um, uh, diagnosis of uh, strain on the ventricle. So early diagnosis of uh, left ventricular dysfunction and beginning treatment early. And I think probably uh, following the NT pro BNP is extremely useful. That has to be followed up uh, with uh, imaging and uh, uh, depending on the clinical situation, in many instances, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, a good uh, 2D echo will, will tell you a great deal about the function of the ventricle. So I would start out with uh, measuring the NT pro BNP, following it closely, and, uh, uh, and then with um, uh, routine uh, uh, transthoracic echocardiography. Of course, uh, um, in puzzling cases, you have to go on to um, MRI. And before I switch the mic further to my colleagues, maybe from your very personal perspective, because some of the drugs you mentioned and the approaches come from the opposite direction, really, remembering that beta blockers used to be forbidden, really, because of the negative anotropic effect. What was, in your own experience, the most puzzling, the most important development in therapy? The single most important. <laughs> if, um, if, if that's possible, or, or if that exists at all. Well, I, um, I think the greatest impact on patient care actually goes back to the thiazides because um, patients, patients that I saw as a medical student, uh, not being able to control their edema and having to come into the hospital or to the clinic to get injections every time their um, edema increased and they became short of breath. That was changed and uh, uh, it prolonged life. So it seems like a very minor thing today, but with a great arc of history, uh, it, it, it was extremely important. And then um, I would say in more recent times, um, I have to say that the SGLT2 inhibitors are really extraordinary. And um, uh, I've been studying them carefully. Uh, recently wrote a review in the New England Journal 
where I put together all the information about them, and uh, um, uh, they're so well tolerated, and, uh, uh, and they are capable of um, helping patients if they're acutely ill, if they have high ejection fractions, if they have reduced ejection fractions, there's almost no form of heart failure uh, that, uh, that, that doesn't seem to respond uh, with very few adverse effects. If I may just add upon this, so this developments and treatment of heart failure with all their prognostic implications for our patients are a unique story of success. And when looking back upon all these pharmacological game changers, at least in stable heart failure patients that you outlined here, it looks as if none of these medications were actually initially developed for heart failure patients. Instead, they had some other major indications before their cardioprotective role became evident. Uh, Stefan Schirmer alluded that beta blockers were actually contraindicated in heart failure initially. Spironolactone was a diuretic agent. Uh, SGLT2 inhibitors were anti-diabetics. And it yes. looks as if drugs that were specifically designed for heart failure patients were often less successful. Looking back all these decades, does this surprise you? And do you think that the future will bring more specific options with drugs specifically designed for these patients? Well, uh, first of all, I think that, um, that what you say is, is perfectly correct. Um, it, it, it really is, um, uh, it, yes, it, it was surprising uh, to me. Um, the uh, beta blocker story, I think, uh, um, especially so, because um, um, we studied in uh, experimental animals uh, in the, 19, the late 1960s uh, uh, and uh, showed that beta blockade uh, seemed to make heart failure worse. And so we stayed away from beta blockers. But colleagues in Sweden um, tried it in patients with cardiomyopathy who had tachycardia. And lo and behold, they, uh, they uh, sh showed uh, a benefit. I think um, what we can say now uh, with uh, the value of hindsight is that, um, uh, that the um, sympathetic activation of the heart in heart failure uh, is sort of a we thought of as a protective mechanism. Um, uh, it prevents the blood pressure from, from falling, prevents the patient from going into shock, but it turns out that it is also damaging to the heart and the beta blockers uh, obviate, they reduce that damage. Uh, and I think that um, certainly uh, uh, I wasn't smart enough to make that, uh, uh, make that point, even though we had shown that uh, there was a sympathetic activation, but we didn't think that deactivation would be helpful. So you live and learn. Uh, Dr. Ronald, um, you started off with your early days. And by, by the way, I, I really enjoyed and Found it really fascinating the great book about uh, from from Dr. Lee presenting all those those data in your uh, your early times and a significant mode of action of modern heart failure therapy maybe even related to diuretic therapy so for example in SGLG SGLT2 inhibitors or phenylalanine and some experts um, argue that there might be even a prognostic role for diuretic. Of course, we have we don't don't have any data today. Um, if one would design a large RCT testing the role of loop diuretics and heart failure, could you speculate if that would work out in terms of heart endpoints and prognostic role? Maybe. You mean uh, uh, to study uh, in a randomized clinical trial? Yes. Um, well. Uh, I, I think it would be very difficult to, uh, since we know 
the, uh, the effect, how potent group diuretics are, uh, it would be very difficult uh, to enroll patients into the placebo arm and not offer them group diuretics if they, if they are truly in heart failure. Uh, so I think that, um, but there are trials that are going on now um, at the present time uh, that are comparing different loop diuretics one with the other so that every, uh, every patient gets a loop diuretic, but there may be differences in the potency and that's under uh, active investigation. May I maybe here briefly ask you, what are your ideas on salt reduction nowadays? You told us that the whole story started in, in the 50s when there were few options um, and one of these options has been salt reduction. Now this issue of salt reduction nowadays is discussed rather controversially. Do you believe that with all this novel interventions that you uh, brought into clinical practice, our patients still need salt restriction? Um, I think that's a, an important question. It's a, it's a really good question. Um, I, I think that it is far less important now that we have very good diuretics. I think that, um, um, that uh, unless the patient is in advanced heart failure and, uh, and uh, nearing the end of their course, uh, uh, you can usually, uh, by giving, uh, changing the doses of um, the uh, loop diuretic, you can usually get rid of the sodium. I certainly wouldn't uh, suggest that um, uh, that there be no salt in the diet at all, but I would certainly ask patients with heart failure to remove the salt shaker from the table. Don't add salt, but uh, uh, you can use it in cooking. Um, there used to be a, um, a joke that was told uh, many decades ago that um, uh, reduction of salt doesn't prolong life in patients with heart failure. It just makes life appear to be longer because it is so uh, you know, difficult for patients and it makes the food taste so terrible if they have been used to using salt. So I take a middle course, use salt in cooking and take the salt uh, shaker away from the table in patients with heart failure and watch the dose of the diuretic. Very good question. Maybe put another rather speculative question. You mentioned all the cornerstones of modern heart failure therapy. And um, as a matter of trial reality, we do not have any head-to-head -head comparison. Would that be interesting? Rather speculative? Maybe yeah, interesting. it would be. Yes, it would be interesting, but I wouldn't give it a high priority because um, Because why not use, um, I mean, the, the SGLT2 inhibitors have been shown to have a protective effect in people already on beta blockers. So why take the beta blocker away? Um, so I, 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 I think that um, uh, they, I see them as very, important additions, but I don't see that they would necessarily displace. Now, as, as one of you have said early in this uh, discussion, the ARNI is a replacement for the ACE inhibitor and, and uh, more powerful. 
um, but the others, uh, uh, I, I, I would, um, I think in approaching patients with heart failure now, I think the SGLT2 should be very early uh, in the game, even though it appears as the very last uh, uh, therapy on this slide. Uh, I think that the fact that they're so well tolerated um, uh, and, um, and so effective under so many different circumstances, I would start with an SGLT2 inhibitor, but I would certainly um, also uh, uh, give a uh, beta blocker. The, the beta blockers, um, uh, they tire people out. And uh, I think one of, one of the things that we can do is not get rid of them. But the SGLT2 inhibitors allow you to use lower doses of beta blockers. So the fatigue that comes with beta blockade uh, may be reduced or even eliminated. So that the old rule that we have to go for the highest dosages of beta blockers and ACE inhibitors may not actually be true anymore in 2022? Yes, I, I think that's correct. I think that um, uh, the highest doses of, of both of these drugs uh, have side effects. I mean, we all know patients on ACE inhibitors who develop a cough and, uh, uh, and it could be very disturbing cough. And we know that uh, patients on uh, maximal doses of beta blockers feel fatigued and um, uh, tired all the time. Um, uh, but I wouldn't remove them. I would, uh, 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 with SGLT2s, I think you could probably use much lower doses. Not probably, you can use much lower doses. So, so do you think, and you alluded to it with the SGLT2 inhibitors that we have a therapy across the whole spectrum of ejection fraction. Do you think that's the largest part of, of future development is really HEF-PEF? I mean, we, we have a new drug, Mavacamptain for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I think it's available in the US already, not yet in Europe. Um, do, you, do you see or foresee a larger development there than in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction? Well, um, so I, th I think for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you're speaking about uh, mavacamptin, and um, uh, which uh, is uh, I, I consider to be a very promising drug. Um, it doesn't cure the disease, but it, it's quite interesting. Uh, there's a study going on now. Uh, as you well know, um, the obstruction in HCM uh, usually occurs in, um, over the course of the uh, teen years, you know, between 13, and uh, 20, and uh, the obstruction gets worse with time. Usually it stabilizes around by the age of 30. Um, and the trial that is going on now is to take children who have HCM, who don't have obstruction yet, and see whether you can prevent the obstruction from ever occurring. And I think that's uh, going to be an interesting one to watch. There is a, um, uh, a paper that was published uh, a week ago in, uh, in Jack, uh, presented at the American College of Cardiology uh, from the Cleveland Clinic, and uh, in which uh, uh, patients who had obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy were randomized uh, in double blind 
to uh, mevacaptin or placebo. And uh, the patients on mevacaptin um, uh, did not progress to require uh, uh, surgery as often as the patients on placebo. So this may be a, uh, what we would call a game changer uh, for this disease. Do you see any role for devices like hemodynamic interventions? There was a trial uh, uh, intraatrial shunt or the measurement of pulmonary artery pressure. Do you see any role for that? Well, uh, I think that uh, uh, there is some dispute right now about um, uh, creating an opening in the interatrial septum in patients uh, with FPEF. Um, I would have thought when I learned about this, that this was going to be a natural, that if you can uh, uh, produce a uh, small left to right shunt, uh, and I emphasize small, uh, because you don't want to overburden the right ventricle. Um, uh, but there has been a uh, single trial that was um, of about 500 patients um, uh, that was double blind. In other words, the, uh, a shunt was created in half the patients. The others had a, um, a catheter uh, manipulated in the atrium, but uh, no shunt was created. And there was no difference in, um, uh, in the follow-up. And that goes against a lot of the other information. But it, it was at least, it was a randomized uh, blinded trial. Um, so I think the way this is going to turn out is that in this trial, um, which uh, showed no benefit, probably the shunt was too large. I think in patients with HEFPEF who have, who don't have pulmonary hypertension, and who have a normal, well-functioning right ventricle, I think uh, a five millimeter diameter uh, opening, uh, which can be done uh, with a catheter and a small device in the endatrial septum, um, will be helpful. But that's only a guess. I think it was uh, um, eight millimeters in that particular trial, which allows too large a left to right shunt. So uh, I am not certain about this because it uh, has only undergone this one um, true randomized trial. All the others have been before and after observations. Uh, but I, I, I think there's reason to be hopeful for a fraction of patients. Uh, with an elevated left atrial pressure. It's starting with FF, but I think the same thing could uh, happen with FREF because the problem there also is the elevated left atrial pressure. Um, uh, causing uh, pulmonary venous congestion, pulmonary capillary congestion and uh, left heart failure. So I think we, it's a good question. We're early in the story. Uh, I think there will be room for it, but it has yet to be shown. Now Gunnar Heine has started with, with difficulties, pro and contra. What I would be interested in, Dr. Braunwald, what, what's your personal, um, what, what has kept you up um, being so successful and also, prevailing in your research 
when there were difficult times. I remember I also enjoyed the book by Dr. Lee and, and I remember you're, you're working together with Dr. Morrow um, for the HOCM, the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and patients that haven't aortic stenosis after all. W what has kept you up working and going on all the time? Well, I, um, um, I, I, I think that um, uh, I, I find, uh, have always found the work uh, extremely interesting. Uh, on the edge between uh, science and clinical medicine, so-called translational work where, um, where if you uh, find something that might help people uh, in that you will never see um, uh, people who are in a different country and a different continent, and if, uh, if uh, they can benefit from what you do, it is, um, um, uh, it's a very positive feeling. Now, um, in the last few years, uh, my enthusiasm has grown because I now have this long-term perspective, um, which I certainly didn't have uh, 40 or 50 years ago, um, but, but uh, it's like uh, uh, a, uh, a story. It's like, a, uh, it's like living uh, history. Uh, uh, I feel that uh, I, uh, some of the uh, teachers I had and the contacts I made when I was a student and a resident and a research fellow, uh, all of those people are gone. And uh, these are the great minds of the uh, 30s, 40s, and 50s. And uh, I can now look, uh, I've had been given the opportunity uh, to, uh, to, particip to participate in the history of uh, this field. It's not only heart failure, but it's cardiology as a whole. I also enjoyed very much reading the biography by Dr. Lee. And what I found very impressive, among many other things, that when you were at medical school, when you have been a resident, you have been very eager to get a very broad education training in internal medicine and not to be squeezed too early into the narrower field of cardiology. Now things have changed tremendously in the last decades and internal medicine has split up into subdivisions and even subdivisions like cardiology are being sub split again into arrhythmia and coronary disease. And at the same time, patients get ever older and have a ever higher comorbidity. And we have now drugs that may cure different fields of disease entities. Where do you see the future of general internal medicine? I think that's a, a terrific question. And I think that, um, um, uh, and it's a big problem in the United States. And the, the reason I think it's a bigger problem in America than it is in Europe is because the compensation, the payment and the income of general internists is too low. And people uh, shunted tend to go to specialists. They go to a specialist, uh, they, uh, specialists tend to be narrow. They refer to other specialists. So, Many patients, particularly older patients, have, uh, are being taken care of by multiple specialists. Uh, I have the impression, uh, I may be wrong, but I have the impression that in Europe, uh, the um, uh, general uh, internist uh, still has, uh, uh, has more prestige 
and uh, is uh, is paid better than uh, in the United States. So we find in the United States that very, very few of the students want to go into general internal medicine. Uh, we have you know, the interns that come to our hospital, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and other teaching hospitals um, around the country um, uh, don't, uh, uh, their ambition rarely is to go into general internal medicine. And they, uh, they, in order to be a cardiologist, you have to train in internal medicine, but they all have to practice it. So I think it's a problem. And I, th I think that um, um, it's gonna have to be uh, uh, developed uh, in a way in which there is adequate compensation for being a generalist. Now, I think uh, in reference to me, when I was a student, um, I was thinking about what is the hierarchy? What can I accomplish in medicine? Before I even began to uh, um, think much about cardiology. Um, and uh, being brought up in New York, living in New York, um, I think that um, uh, most of the doctors uh, were general practitioners. And an and internist uh, was, in a way, a specialist in internal medicine. And I thought that that would be uh, my ambition uh, would be to be a good general doctor, uh, like a detective, uh, a diagnostician, uh, and and that uh, patients and that that uh, uh, general practitioners with very little training would refer their difficult cases to me. And for that reason, as you saw in the biography, I took a rotating internship, which is unheard of now, uh, so that I could be exposed to surgery, be exposed to pediatrics, to uh, obstetrics and gynecology. I delivered babies, et cetera. And, um, uh, but that was a different world. And the attitudes uh, uh, then began to change and the hierarchy changed. And uh, um, the, um, the internist um, became, uh, they even changed the title from being a general internist to being a primary care physician, PCP we call them. And I think that that uh, uh, is, um, it's not good for the medical system. It's not good for our patients. We discussed before we met you today with a, about the, and, and that alludes to the point Gunnar Heine made, um, going from a broad, broad clinical education into an even broader view of people um, being excellent in their clinical work, but also in research and also in teaching, something you have really accomplished, of course, through your life. Um, do you think this is the way we'll be going on, to, on into the future? I mean, that we, we, we've been discussing that a lot because with, with the even more and more complicated, um, especially basic research techniques, the more and more complicated clinical techniques, especially in interventional cardiology, is that still possible? Do you yeah, think yeah. that's maybe even mandatory or rather? Well, I think, no, 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 no. You, again, I think you're asking a very good question. A very good question. So uh, during the um, during the nineteen seventies and the nineteen eighties, uh, when I was chairman of the Department of Medicine um, at the Brigham and at Harvard, uh, 
we talked about, um, uh, we used the term triple threat. A triple threat was somebody who uh, was a, first of all, a great doctor, took good care of his patients, all her patients at one. A great teacher, a mentor, and a brilliant scientist. Um, and that was possible uh, for many people. Um, and uh, they uh, reached very high levels uh, in the profession. And uh, I think that is getting harder and harder. I think that to be a good doctor now, to really take care of your patients, you have to be available um, seven days a week. You have to be able to take call and, um, um, and you have to be available for patients and for their families. Uh, you can't go away uh, to a meeting of the American Heart Association in another city or to the ESC in Barcelona and so forth. Um, uh, unless you have a very special setup. Um, by the same token, if you're a scientist, um, you can't take time off from your science uh, to, um, uh, to be on call and to be up at night uh, taking care of uh, very sick people. So I think that what you're getting at in your question, I think is that, um, is that there will be fewer people who are triple threats uh, in the future than there are now. I think that um, uh, teaching, of course, and getting the next generation of people, giving them information uh, uh, is something that, that everyone has to do. And it is done differently by scientists who have somebody working at the bench um, uh, as opposed to a um, resident or a clinical intern. Um, so, uh, or a medical student. Uh, so I think that um, if you divide, if you divide the doctor or the future into a scientist investigator or a clinician, primarily, primarily, not exclusively, but primarily, then each of them has an obligation to teach, but you teach quite differently. In science, you basically teach laboratory, uh, you teach um, the scientific method, uh, you teach basic uh, sciences, um, and um, uh, you try to indicate how they relate to clinical medicine, but the emphasis is on the science. And uh, then you produce scientists. Um, and clinicians obviously train uh, medical students for practice and uh, interns and residents for practice. And they should learn something about the background of science, but not actually do the science. Um, I think that is what we're heading to. Uh, because I think as you point out in your question, which I think is very thoughtful, uh, that things are getting more and more complicated. And uh, there's just so much that uh, a, a brain can hold. Um, I will tell you another joke. Uh, people say that um, generalists uh, know 
less and less about more and more. And pretty soon they won't be knowing anything about everything. They will not know anything about everything because there is so much in general medicine. Uh, specialists know more and more about less and less. And pretty soon they will know everything about nothing because they become so specialized. Now, these are the two extremes, and I'm telling it to you, not as something that I believe, I'm telling it to you as a joke, uh, but I think that is uh, uh, seriously, that is what we're heading in that direction. Because, you know, um, cardiology was a field um, when I started out, that um, uh, was based on uh, the stethoscope, uh, the blood pressure cuff, uh, the electrocardiogram. And if you could use those three things, that made you a cardiologist. And of course, now we have very, very complex things. And you have some people who are interventionalists in their interventionalists and they specialize and left main coronary artery disease. And, um, um, and uh, don't do anything else. Or well, they're very good at uh, ablation of, the, uh, of atrial fibrillation uh, and, um, and are very narrow. Um, and on the other hand, we have what I refer to as the primary care physician who basically has to, uh, or an emergency room physician, uh, who basically has to uh, take patients as they come in uh, and as they present and triage them. Know enough who has to be seen by a surgeon, who has to be seen by a neurologist and so forth. Um, so there is, um, uh, while it's a joke, uh, to present it the way I did, there is a move in that direction. People becoming too specialized. I guess the other part of the story is that you personally and your generation accepted working conditions that hardly anybody would accept nowadays. So we learned that you have been on call every other night. You had some 90 or 100 hours per week that you spent either in the hospital or in the lab. I think you hardly find anybody nowadays who would do this job with this tight schedule. I think, yeah, I think that's correct. Um, as a matter of fact, um, we have um, a uh, law that uh, for interns and residents in our hospitals, uh, that they cannot uh, work more than 80 hours a week. If they work longer than 80 hours, then the, the program can be decertified. And actually, that happened um, at Johns Hopkins Hospital one of the best hospitals in the country, if not in the world. I spent a year there. And uh, uh, they uh, were uh, examined by an outside agency uh, and found that, um, uh, that they were making their interns uh, work about 100 hours a week and um, including that, that call. And uh, so their program uh, was decertified. Of course, they immediately changed it and joined the club of 80 hours a week. Um, surgical residents don't like it because they want to be in the operating room. And um, 
Uh, they don't want to go home if a new patient comes in and, uh, and they can uh, assist in an operation and so on, but they are not allowed. The program has to send them home um, uh, so that they don't exceed the 80 hour limit. I don't know if you have that in Europe, but I, I think I think you I think the quality of life for um, uh, I think is better in Europe than it is in the United States for physicians. Well, we have a maximum of here in Germany forty eight hours working time plus being on call. Thank well, you. Well, I can tell you. So, you know, the, the reason I. Um, uh, you asked me why I'm so interested in, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a link to the past. Uh, so I, I told you just a minute ago that I spent a year of my medical, general medical residency at Johns Hopkins. And uh, they had the most, uh, this is in the 1950s, they had the most rigid system in the world, uh, there was no time off. You had a week's vacation a year. Now it sounds insane, but the living quarters were uh, pretty good and they were within a block or two of the hospital. You could go home at night to sleep, but you were on call all the time. And um, uh, it was very difficult to uh, um, raise a family under those circumstances, uh, but you were basically on call all the time. Now it, it made up because if everybody was on call, that meant the number of uh, times you would be woken up at night was, everybody had fewer patients because everybody was covered. Um, uh, so uh, we went to see the chairman of the department and we, uh, uh, I went together with uh, two colleagues because we were afraid of him. And we said uh, uh, that uh, uh, would he consider giving two nights off a week where we wouldn't be on call. And uh, uh, instead of seven nights a week, what about five? Uh, and he said, uh, well, when you're on call at night, do you learn much medicine? And we said, oh yes, absolutely. Yes, because you see the patient's very fresh. You work them up immediately uh, rather than being handed over a patient who's already been worked up. He said, well, you see, we want you to learn medicine and you learn more if you're on call seven nights a week than five. And then he opened the door and he let us out. Of course, this became impossible uh, because people wouldn't apply. You see, this was at a time when very few of the residents were married and none of them had children. So there was no life, really. Uh, if you were a resident, the, the word reside means live there. And that, um, uh, that's, how, uh, that's how the term resident uh, um, was inaugurated. And then, of course, Johns Hopkins, um, um, in order to get very good people, had to give them nights off. And it was a huge, by that time I was gone, but um, uh, when I came to Harvard, um, we had an every other night system um, 
and uh, uh, but we were beginning to run into trouble uh, getting the best uh, students to come into our program. So we uh, the major change that I made was a change to every third night. May I ask a question, um, Dr. Bono? In in Boston and during your time in California, you acted as a as a manager. You were responsible not only for clinical program, uh, programs, but also for economy. And as a team leader, I always find it really hard to stay connected with science and with the basics. And do you tell us, can tell us a secret how you managed not to lose track because you never lost track to all that uh, projects and the Timmy group? Is there a secret? When I got to California, uh, I brought with me, I had been chief of cardiology and clinical director of the National Heart Institute in Bethesda, where I worked for 13 years. And, um, and when I went to California, uh, I brought with me uh, five colleagues who had been my team uh, in Bethesda. Uh, and, um, uh, and so we worked as a team. Um, and I think that, so the science in a sense, um, I was, I spent less time in the experimental laboratory um, personally, and more time going over the data and developing the protocols and, uh, and um, writing the paper, uh, and not the many, many hours of, uh, of working, uh, usually either with dogs or with isolated uh, heart muscle removed uh, from the papillary muscles of cats. Which, which were the two experimental things. So I was able to drop that part. The second thing change that I made was I reduced the number of uh, hours a week that I devoted to research. Um, uh, instead of being full-time, I spent about a third of my time in research. And, um, uh, and I was able to make that work. Uh, and then, of course, when I got to Boston, um, the department was uh, even larger. There was even more administration. And then I got involved with uh, two textbooks and uh, had to weave them in, both internal medicine and cardiology books. Well, um, Dr. Bronwald, um, we've been uh, already taking quite a lot of your time. Have, I have no pressuring further questions, although we could be talking on forever, probably. Gunnar? Thanks so much. It was really a privilege for us to have you. Well, it was nice to speak with you, and I appreciate uh, the questions, because I think that they're very meaningful questions. Thank you.